Hello again from Pipers Persuasion, Alan Halton here. And uh, just to give you an introduction to our next interviewee, John Walsh. John Walsh, uh, originally English, I moved to Scotland and he moved across to Canada. Lots of other steps, as you will hear in between. And is currently in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and I was fortunate to link up with him on Sunday, the 20th of January 2022, and we had an internet conversation. Antigonish, incidentally, is the longest continuous Highland Games in the world outside of Scotland. John informs us that he was self-taught in piping. This uh, caught me completely unawares and I reacted accordingly. I expressed the surprise. On reflection, however, I realised that uh, probably a very high number of you sitting watching this today are self-taught also. And John Walsh has brought this observance and listening to a very high degree and it made him a successful and an accomplished piper, as you will hear. Uh, the other point that arose uh, from the interview was how he memorised tunes initially. I uh, had him subsequently explain this to you. He started off speaking about his bagpipe business I have moved on to pipe bands, uh, shots twice, and sandwich in between was a world championship with 70 Fraser Highlanders. We have an experienced and intelligent piper, so all I need to do is ask you to sit back and enjoy. I start by wishing you, John Walsh, good day to you and thanks very much for taking part in this discussion with Piper's Persuasion. Uh, I was just saying in a wee intro that I might keep that uh, this is a, a first venture for me in Zoom. I've I usually sent people's houses with cameras and talk to them and all that sort of thing. It's much easier. but. <laughs> We're in the, we're in the, the lap of the gods here with them. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, I'm just going to hit you right away with your bagpipe business. And uh, we'll do a, a few moments or five minutes or ten, how long, however long it takes for you to describe uh, John Walsh bagpipes. So I, I read on your website that um, you do the Great Highland Bagpipe, the Small Pipes, the Practice Chanters and the Retro Pipes and the, uh, uh, of course, my favourite, uh, knowing you through other people uh, from way back, was the Shuttle Pipes. Was that uh, the first uh, venture uh, into manufacturing? Uh, did you do other stuff before Shuttle? No, the Shuttle Pipe was the first thing I ever got. Right. I, uh, that originated from a, a, a picture that I saw in uh, Edinburgh Castle. Can't think of the guy's name. Uh, he's got a beard and he's playing what looked like a cylinder for a drone. Uh -huh. uh, and he's got the big broad rimmed hat. Uh, and it turned out, which I didn't know, to be uh, a musette. It's, it's well, well, you see it all over the place once you know it's you see it, you, you kind of notice it. Yeah. And that sat with me when I was in Scotland. And when I came over here, uh, I thought of a, something that would be really user-friendly, you know, a bag. And uh, the idea was to use practice chatter reads. Okay. So I thought, how can we do that? And then I remembered the, this cylinder thing. So I thought, well, we could try that. So I gave that a go and it, and it seemed to work okay. Yeah. Uh, and the idea was to have just a regular practice chanter, but again, it evolved a little bit more to uh, to be better in tune, and so uh, that was the idea. And you could put it under your bed for six months and yeah. take it out, 
and it would still go, you know, which it, is what it does. Uh, but that's uh, the, the story about Cold Wind uh, Pipes, really, that they stay in tune uh, quite well, lay them down and pick them up a week later, and oh, it takes yeah. a moment or two to be back on song sort of thing. Right, yeah. they, very popular shuttle pipes at that time, weren't they? They, they were, they, they still are. I, I can't oh. believe we, we've been making them since uh, 19, no, when did we come down here? Thir it's about 30 years. Right. We started off making them and uh, they just took off uh, oh. like like hotcakes. And uh, I was making them and I just by myself. And, oh. and I was buy buying reeds in and, oh. and that was the idea. Yeah. Just regular reeds, and then it got to the point where I realised the practice chanter reeds are not very accurate. So you'd, yeah. you'd get a bunch of reeds that work well, and the next time they wouldn't work. And so I ended up messing around making my own reeds. See, when you're talking about practice chanter reeds, are you talking cane reeds or are you talking plastic? It's plastic. They're yeah. all plastic. Yeah. That, that was the idea. All plastic reeds. How many reeds uh, did you have from the shuttle pipes then? Well, it started off with a, a two drone, just uh -huh. a bass and a tenor. Okay. And then we added the third drone for, for choice, which is an E. They're, 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 we tuned them to A, so they're, they're in a pitch that's useful. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I discovered is for uh, less, I, I don't want to uh, put anybody down, but for, for, the, for the new piper, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, the drones over the shoulder, mm -hmm. because they can't see them, it's it's a thing that they it's kind of foreign to try and tune them. Yeah. But when they're across the front of you and you just move this slider up and down and they can see it, yeah, it could get them in tune a little bit easier than than a. It's, it, a it's, it's yet another sense that's been brought into play uh, to control uh, the instrument, if you like. Yeah. And, and they could they could get it to sound reasonable and uh, put it down and they didn't drown everybody out at a party. You know, you go to a party, somebody says, get the pipes out. And in five minutes, there's only two people listening, you and the guy that asked if you'd play a tune. <laughs> everybody else has cleared off. <laughs> I, well, that, I, I, funnily enough, I was playing the, the small pipes, the bellows pipes at New Year. And I found the exactly opposite. It's probably my bad piping right enough, but I found that after a wee while folk were talking over the top of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, you, of course you make the small pipes as well, don't you? Well, it trans. We said we've got like all the eggs in one basket. You know, if if yeah. if and when people get fed up with them, which they will, uh, we have to be doing something else. So we transferred over uh, to making. Uh, small pipes, regular like everybody else's small pipes, you know. Mouth blown or a bellows or both? The both. Yeah, the both. Good, good. Yeah, we have a, a system where you, you, you get the, a combination, uh -huh. which means you can, uh, the stocks are really short. Yes. Uh, so you can either have a blowpipe with, a, with the, the, the stock uh -huh. normally, or you put a little plug in that, cover it over, and then at the side where the bellows go, yeah. you put the same stock in there and connect your bellows up. Oh, so you, oh, oh. You, you, can, you can do both. Both. And what people do, they buy the, uh, the mouth blown and then they say, oh, I'd like to try the bellows. So they just buy the bellows and, and plug it into the side of the bag. The, the bellows uh, takes a, uh, they take a few weeks of uh, patience, but once you get into them, they're excellent. Again, you can lay them down and pick them up a, a, yeah. a while later and they're yeah. more or less still in tune as long as you have yeah. been battering furniture with them or whatever. What about the retro pipes? I saw these on the website as well. All the retro is, uh, it's a two-drawn small pipe. We okay. take the baritone off it yeah, yeah. and there are no, uh, no furrows. Uh, <laughs> that's a garden, say it, not set, in, instead of having yeah. like to this with yeah. a furrow on it, they're just plain like Aye. that. So, uh, and, and the actual main stock is much smaller, uh -huh. it's, yeah. it's cheaper and smaller, so you can keep the price down. It's only the two drones, but it's the same, the same two drones, the same chanter, and the same reeds. Well, it still encourages uh, the buyer who hasn't got a lot of money to fling about. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the idea, you know. And what kind of wood do you use, say, uh, for these instruments? I well, noticed... We, well, we used a lot of uh, plastic. Plastic's uh -huh. really popular because it's so robust. But we use, a, we, we use black wood to start off with. Uh, but it, it didn't seem to make an awful lot of difference except to the money. Yeah. And then when that CITES came on, we started switching over to, uh, we use rosewood, uh, uh -huh. you know, Mexican uh -huh. ebony, uh, any, any sort of hard wood, uh, we can, you know, you can, they, they sound okay. It's the moisture that causes the problem, it's not the wood drill, you know. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So the, 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 you can the spend the fortune on it. You can spend a fortune on an African black, a blackwood chant, and it'll bend. It'll bend just the same as a, a half the price. And what about your, uh, 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 your great island bagpipes, say, uh, popular too, John? Uh, well, we, we, we made those for a number of years. Uh, uh, there, there was a point in the business. I, I, I started on my own uh, and I needed help. Uh, my wow. wife came in to help. Uh, and then for a long while, we had a, a, a shop uh, with a gift shop. Yeah. And there was, there was uh, 10 of, uh, 11 of us full time and one part time. It was a, and that was, that was hard work. Uh, personalities and, you know, all the stuff going out. You had to keep up with what was going out the door and orders. Oh, my gosh. So three or, three or four years, I'll correct that. 
maybe six or seven years, we decided to get rid of the shop. And now there's just the three of us. We have a workshop in the back. Mm-hmm. So we, we kind of dropped the Highland pipes uh, yeah. and tried to back everything off. But with this COVID, it, oh, goodness gracious me, it, everybody wants to try something. So we're, we're busier now than we've been for the last 20 years. I think I, the, the cold wind pipes, the small pipes and all these bellows pipes, they've taken off because of COVID, haven't they? Aye, of course. All the, all the sets that were made 27 years ago, they're hauled out from under the bed. And, Aye. Oh, I think I might need new reeds. After. Reeds? God and Bennett. So, <laughs> are you making the reeds as well, John? Yeah, yeah. My, yeah. That's hard work. Yeah. It's it constant. Aye. You know, Aye. Aye. you make Aye. you make 20, 20 shuttle chanter reeds Aye. and you say that'll do. And within three days, they're gone. Aye, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, you're just making them drone reeds, and uh, and I swore I would never get into practice chanter reeds, but I ended up making practice chanter reeds. John, did you ever go into pipe chanter reeds? A uh, pipe no. chanter, say, making pipe chanters, sorry. No, no, no it's just it's enough, another no, science of that, isn't oh, it? Yeah. yeah. And it's a very time consuming to get it right, too. I, I, I think. If you spend enough money on tooling, yeah, you stand a good chance. Aye. But even then, you've got your cane to deal with, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, still, yeah. it's still a, a material... There's too many var- variables, really, yeah. for the, 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 the yeah. uh, small market and that sort of yeah. thing. But they, it, so what kind of machines do you use? Is it hand-turning or do you use uh, automatic lathes? Or what? Oh, oh, no, there's no automatic... No, it's all hand done. Everything's hand done. Aye. We have a tracing lathe to give the profile. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's a, a basic tracing lathe. Well, yeah. well, we've two. Uh-huh. It, we've nine lathes. We've nine. Well, so okay. we've got. They're all over the place. In the a tiny little workshop with nine yeah. lathes in it. <laughs> you, you, John, you were born in Bradford, and your yeah. uh, your mum's English and your dad's Coke Bridge. Is that correct? That's right, Kubrick, yeah. Yeah, uh, so when were you born? When was I born? Aye. Uh, May 15th, 1952. Yeah, yeah. You're only a boy. I'm 1943. So, 43. Uh, Just a couple of years. Aye, absolutely. But uh, you grew up in, in Bradford, I understand, and... Uh, but you taught yourself initially, what, what took you to, uh, what, why did you want to learn the uh, bagpipes when you're down in the uh, Bradford? Well, the story is, uh, my, my mother played, uh, my mother was real, believe it or not, a good banjo player. Uh-huh. Uh, and she she could sing and, and it turned out my father from Coat Brig, you know how some people like bagpipes and some people really don't? Yes. Yeah. And he, he was a don't. Oh, well, <laughs> he I did not to. like the pipes. <laughs> and, and there was an advert in the newspaper for pipers and drummers wanted for the local band, which was a, called it Hazley Mansfield Pipe Band, okay. that eventually changed the name to the city of Bradford. Okay. Uh, and she says, you're going to learn to play the bagpipes. I says, and I was, I think, 11, maybe, or 12. And I said, no, I, I might play drums. So I, I went up, my dad took me up. And uh, I said, I want to be a drummer. And they said, well, we don't have any drumsticks. We have a practice chanter and a Logan's tutor book. Take these, play around with it, and come back in six or seven weeks, and we should have some drumsticks. I said, all right. So I took the book home and played around with it, and six or seven weeks later, oh, we don't have any drumsticks yet. They haven't shown up. How are you getting on with the book? So I I played it, and uh, long story short, Sure, I never did get any drumsticks, and oh, and that's how I can sort of learn from the book, oh. uh, and then just watching the guys in the, the it was a, probably a grade five band, uh, but you just watch them and how they play, and that that's that was what I I, I kind of did. My first bagpipe that they gave me, uh, they gave me a tenor drone. Uh, it was a complete bagpipe with one reading. One, one tenor drone read. Go home and blow that till you can blow it steady. Well, after three or four days, I was really fed up blowing this 
one read. So I went to the local music store like a, an idiot and asked, do you have any bagpipe reads? And of course he opened the drawer and here these dried up things, you know, that have been in there for years. I said, oh, we can sell you them. So of course I put them in and nothing really worked. And uh, I eventually got uh, some decent reads, but I could never get the bass drum to work. It would never work. Uh, so I was at the, the band practice one day, sitting there, and the, I noticed the pilot major tuned the top section of somebody's drone. Aye. And I thought, I've never seen that before. I'll have to check mine. So when I got home, I, I went to, to check it, and the top was jammed right down. Aye. And it was, it was glued down. I so I pull, it, pull it, and here it had been broken off, and they just glued the top ah, to the mid. Aye, aye, aye. And I, I, did, I, I didn't know any better until I saw him actually physically tune it, you yeah. know. So uh, I, I played for a little while with the two drones, uh, and by now uh, I was enjoying playing. Uh, Occasionally, you'd, you'd, you'd speak to one of the guys in the band uh, and say, am I playing this right? You know, and they say, yeah, it's all right. Okay. And then next week, you'd go and try something else. And I remember playing, the, f the first tune I learned was the uh, Earl of Mansfield, you know. Uh, that's that's quite a lovely tune. A lovely tune. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's quite tricky, tricky in a way, too. You know. Three parts. Oh, yeah, that's I, could, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't pick a two-part or a four-part. I picked three which always struck me as odd. I think it might have been the first tune in the Logan's book. And that's, that's really all, all, all I did for instruction. And then uh, I played in the band and the pipe major was uh, from Scotland and his brother, uh, John Gilchrist. Uh, and he was, he was an okay player and I would watch him, you know, closely. And that's how I learned, watching and see what they did, and then I'd go home and try and do the same thing, you know? Oh, yeah. Who was Bill Barnford? Ah, Bill Barnford was just, uh, uh, he was the drum major of the band. Ah, right. Uh, and he looked like a true Scot Scots bagpipe player. Right. He looked the part, he was a good-looking guy, and he, and he carried himself, and he'd have the proper gear, and he'd play slow tunes, and people thought he was absolutely marvellous. Uh, he couldn't play two grace notes to save his life, but he looked good, and people liked it because he played tunes they knew. So you know, what, what was your first uh, sort of formal creation, proper creation? And the, and the bagpipe? Oh, uh, that would be after I'd gone to Scotland, uh, and I'd just joined Shots. Uh, that would be, oh my gosh, 1974, 1975. But you must have, did you teach yourself up to first grade standard? Yeah, pretty much. Aye. Pretty much. I played, I played with Lanarkshire Police for a little while. Aye, that the first time. I, 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 I'm totally amazed by that, day, uh, that you, you managed to do that. Did you, you obviously yeah. paid a lot of attention when you were listening and observing yeah. others and all the rest of oh, it. Oh, yeah. I, did you listen to a lot of recordings or what, John? Uh, you mentioned about how I uh, learned tunes at the beginning. Uh, it was... <laughs> I'm not really sure how it came about other than purely by accident. Uh, back then, when I'd be, I don't know, 13, 14, I think it'd be, maybe, um, I had a little record player and I, uh, I had managed to find three albums. One was uh, Muirhead and Sons, one was Invergordon Distillery and I, can't, I think the, the last one was a Shots one. Uh, it might have been Edinburgh Police, I can't remember, there was three of them. I remember Muirheads and the one that fascinated me the most was Invergordon because they played everything differently to everybody else. Uh, faster and, and sort of more lively and they had the p on the end, which was great. So uh, I, I used to go to bed, maybe read a book and, and listen to one of the albums and then 
I don't exactly know what I was doing in particular, but I finally, you know, I would put these three albums on the old record player, they're all 33 RPM, got big vinyl records, and, uh, and I had a pair of headphones, and I would put the headphones on and fall asleep listening to these things. Uh, and the, each one would play, play the one side, and then that would be, it'd switch off sometime during the night. And uh, I did it for, oh, jeepers, you know, three or four nights and play the other sides and listen to that and listen. And all of a sudden, uh, tunes were coming to mind as I was, usually as I was on my way to school. Uh, I had to I had about a maybe thirty minute walk to school, and it was more of a march to school as opposed to a, a walk, because I would be humming these tunes and, and marching along in my head to these tunes, and uh, I, I found that all these tunes uh, were becoming easy to play because I had them memorized. But I didn't sit down and memorize them. They, they kind of just formed in my head while I was asleep, which was absolutely fantastic as far as I could think. Uh, I, I did that, for, oh, I probably did that for two or three years. You know, listen to various albums and, and, and pipe bands and what have you. And, and the tunes just stick when you're asleep. Your subconscious, I guess, picks them up and uh, you know, you find you suddenly real that you you you'll, they'll come to mind from from nowhere, and and you you pretty much know the tune, and then you just have to start putting the grace notes to it. You know, make sure you got the the right grace notes, which uh, also seem to fall into place. So I guess learning tunes at the beginning there was was quite easy. The first tune I learned from the the Logan's Tutor book was the. Uh, Earl of Mansfield, why I picked a three-party tune, I, I never know, but anyway, so that's how I learned them at the beginning. Uh, I, I've never really worked on it since, but I, I've no doubt it would work, because I think it, your brain does all, it never goes to sleep, does it? It goes into different phases, and, uh, and that's how I learned them. That was that. Ever record yourself when you were learning just to play back and see what you were doing and all that sort of stuff? No, never. So that, that's, no. Uh, that's quite an amazing uh, ability just to have picked everything yeah. up. So uh, you come up to uh, Scotland and, and the Lanarkshire Police Pipe Band, was that the yeah. first, first band you yeah. went to? Yeah. Anyway, uh, Campbell McGugan and the Lanarkshire uh, Police Pipe Band um, they're doing quite well, that band, and they had Sinclair Chanters that Campbell had got. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hugh McInnes, I don't know if you remember Huey. Yeah, I know, I knew Hugh very, very well. I, uh, yeah, I, I would watch him right. when he was playing, closely watch him. He was a very, very much a stickler for exactitude and his fingering and everything else. Yeah, yeah. He was he was the first guy I studied right. watching him every every time he played. Uh, he, his style, the style that I adopted, uh, was Ian Morrison. It was right. originally was Ian Morrison, and then right. Pipe Sergeant Ian Morrison, and then Pipe Major Ian Morrison, okay. and that's when the piping the, the the piping was going from like the jigs going from the hippity hoppity sound to the straight. That that was the time when all that changed, um, and uh, I, I went for the straight way. I, the straight way I find is a, a, a slightly more musical anyway, and and it's I think it uh, lends much more flow to the whole tune really. Yeah. Well, you can move it, move it around yeah. to 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 make it sort of hip hoppy, but not not as it was as these these people would talk. See, I was taught way back in the sixties, uh, the fifties and sixties, and it was all 
heavily pointing, it uh, didn't yeah. matter what you were uh, playing, everything yeah. across all the time signatures was heavily, very heavily pointed, including yeah. your jigs and your horn pipes as well. Yeah. Uh, aye, aye it's, it's amazing that, but Hugh, uh, he was the first guy that told me that when he was practicing for competitions, he'd play a march six times. And mm. we got to the fourth time made an error. That was the first performance to play it six times without a, a blemish free, free sort of thing and then do the same with the suspes and the reels. Yeah. Aye. Did you ever adopt anything like that yourself, John? Yeah. Yeah. Hugh used to walk around. Uh, it was a traffic warden and he had his practice chanter in, in his pocket. Uh -huh. And he'd hide in doorways and he would play. So if ever you drove around, uh, I can't think of the, the name of the place, Mul Mulgai maybe. Aye. If ever you drove around, you'd, you'd see him hidden in the corner playing away. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he made marvellous pipe chanter reads as well at one point. He, he, uh, he, he perfected it and the yeah. night he perfected it, he was phoning Campbell and he was leaving a message and he took a heart attack on the phone. Uh -huh. And that's and that's when he passed away. And these he was telling Campbell, I've finally got the perfect read here. I know exactly what I'm doing. It's absolutely great. And then collapsed and died. Amazing. And uh, yeah. I, I know that uh, these tools lay about for a long, long uh, while because yeah. somebody was looking for a lot of money for them, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, you moved on, uh, you went on uh, B. Cal for a wee while. Uh, that was when I was in England, yeah. Uh, ah, right, okay. It was when I, I, I hadn't actually emigrated by then. Right, uh-huh. I'd spent some time in Canada, uh, and I played with the Toronto district with Ronnie Rollo, his band. Yeah. Uh, that was just a, like a holiday thing. Okay. And then when I went home... Uh, I think it was when the Glen Fiddich was on. I, I arrived home on the Thursday and then drove up to Glasgow to, or wherever it was to watch this competition. And when I walked in, uh, Jimmy Lidl, who played with the uh, B. Cal, I, I didn't know him, but it, it, and he said, John, do you want to play with B. Cal? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Uh, I, I don't know. Why? Well, we're going to uh, Texas on Tuesday. If you want to come down, uh, we can get your uniform and we'll fly you down. And uh, okay, so, so that's how I ended up playing with Big Al. How long were you there with them, John? Was it just a short time or what? It was about. It was about a year. Aye, aye, aye. It was about a year. So, what's the time frame of it? Short, say. I I started with shots. Uh, it would be the end of 74. Okay. After the end of the season with 74. Uh, I didn't think I would. I remember there was a drummer in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the band, Lanarkshire Police, John Scullion. Yes. And he'd, he'd gone over to Shots and he said, you've got to come down and play with Shots. I said, I'm not good enough for that. I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, no, 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 no. You've got to come down. And I, I wouldn't go. And then finally, he said to me, all right, Tom's expecting you on Monday. Bring your pipes, come down early. Okay. okay. So I went down and I had to play a few tunes and and uh, I ended up in the band. And okay. I was there from 74, and I think till the end of four, five, six, seven, to the end of 77. That would be a good experience, uh. Uh, with the McAllisters and the shots were going very well at that point too, weren't they? They, they, they changed from wooden chanters to plastic chanters. Was that the Warmack things? Yeah. yeah I, was I, in, in I the remember band. that, aye. And he was using Warmack reeds initially and then he started to make his own, didn't he? And I never saw him using Warmack. I only ever saw his own reeds. Aye, right. I, but that these, was in before I got there. These reeds they, were very famous, the McAllister reeds. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And very they, hard. Aye, very, very hard. hard. Uh, I 
remember uh, Ian McClellan, that was his favourite reads, you know, yeah. in the Strathclyde yeah. Police Band and uh, one of uh, the guys who played with him uh, said that because of the, the reads that, that Ian gave him, you know, uh, the McAllister reads, he, uh, this chap did two hernias and had to stop playing. <laughs> So, as Ian, you, he's, oh Ian used to say to me, listen, Scotty, he says, hey, there's no bad blowing in my band. He says, well, you, there's only hey, two ways of blowing. It's a light, an electric light switch either goes or it doesn't go. So you don't blow it full blast, then you're, you're, you're off. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, it was all power. Uh, so. the, 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 unfortunate, the unfortunate thing with that that trip to shots was everything was secret ah. if ever he adjusted your read he'd turn his back on you and he never he never never said much mm -hmm. never said anything there was a lot of self-discipline in the band yeah if you struck up and your pipe was going well the guys would go hey well great you know uh, and if a drone stopped or or something happened rubbish you know hey, hi. And Tom, Tom never said a word about that stuff. And uh, I can't say as I, the, the main thing that I learned was from the, from the band, uh, like to Johnny Barclay. He, oh. he was Johnny Barclay, Danny Connors and Ian McIntyre, watching these guys, how, how they operated their pipes and uh, uh, the sounds that they got and copied those fellas. They had and, a pretty uh, tremendous tone at that thing. Didn't yeah, it? yeah. Great no tape. There was never any tape on the channel, oh. so you, you had all the volume right. and all the hemorrhoids to go with it. <laughs> but again, he, he had the facility to adjust instruments and the reeds and all that, so he had a greater latitude to match up. So it must have been easier for him uh, rather than, than the other bands but, uh, not to use tape because he had the ability, he had all these... Uh, reads and everything else that you could play about with, but uh, uh, certainly that gives you a volume if you've no tape on and all the rest of it. Oh, absolutely. And the big sheepskin bags, of course, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah. cane drone reads. Right? Cane, cane reads, sheepskin oh. bags, the whole. Yeah. I remember one night there was a, a visitor came down and he was, had, he had new reads for the band. It was coming up to the contest season and somebody, somebody was over with a band from. Australia, New Zealand, and they were picking up a box of reeds, uh -huh. and and he had the box on the side. And I remember he came he came in and, and he was talking to Tom. And Tom said, "There's your reeds," and he said, "I've heard that you send all the the, the poor reeds over to uh, other countries." And Tom looked. Tom looked at him. That's not right. And immediately he took the box. And he took all the reeds that he was going to give to the band, put them in the guy's box, and put the guy's reeds in the band, right in front of him. Right. <laughs> and there was there, there was no there were no no, uh, no cheated no seconds. To be fair to McAllister's reeds at that time, I don't think there were many bad ones there. They're all uh, quite high quality reeds and all this. Oh, they were good, yeah. they were good reeds. Yeah, I made it into his workshop once. Mm -hmm. It was under a. Uh, I think it was under a hairdresser or something in shots on the main street, but you had you had to be like five foot one to get in. Right. <laughs> it was a really low season. Uh, it's the ceiling, looking right. <laughs> out. But they had a little room with a press, and I, I just saw it. And then uh, on the way by, absolutely the one, the one was there a Willie? Willie? Aye. Willie. He uh, he did a lot of work in in the back room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then John assembled them. Yeah. And and Tom kind of tested them. Yeah. It was just a little system they had, you know, and it was, uh, once you worked out a system, uh, and I, I remember how they shaved the reeds down, the, the tool they had to shave them down. And yeah. I just I just got to see it, and then he threw me out. I said, okay, I, trust me, I don't want to make janitor reeds. <laughs> I was worried I was going to copy them. Uh, but you find that with all the, the, the reed makers, they want to keep yeah. uh, that wee vital part just up their sleeve yeah. and, 
uh, they're a wee bit cautious in case somebody copies oh, yeah. their methodology. Well, a lot of effort goes into it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, we'll move on uh, okay. swiftly because a wee bit of ground to cover. Uh, now, Ronnie Lor uh, Rollo, uh, Bruce Gandy's late father-in-law, uh, you alluded to him earlier and uh, yeah. a brief mention about the Toronto industry. Um, so, you'd been across there just ever so briefly. D did, yeah. you, did you make up your mind to go out there uh, to emigrate? Uh, what, what, what happened there? Well, I, I was uh, over a couple of times with the shots at the CNE, the tattoo. Yeah. And I was amazed at how how it was. It, uh, it looked clean and tidy and bright. And I thought I'd love to come over here. And uh, I met Ronnie there, and and we worked on trying to get me out there. But the mistake I was making, I was trying to emigrate from Scotland. Uh, and after the fact, I was told. Chances of getting in from Scotland is is limited at the moment. I don't know whether it was true or not, but there's a lot of strikes everywhere, yeah. and all the unions were run by Scotsmen. Well, that's true. So I, uh, I I I tried to get in from Birmingham and was accepted. And no, there was nothing different. So I, I don't know if it was real or not. It could just be them. It's a, perce a perception, really, by certain yeah. people. I yeah. But uh, certainly the 70s, there uh, were plenty of uh, strikes, and that's why I left engineering. Uh, the Rolls yeah. Royce went into the police because of uh, oh, right. unions and strikes and all the rest of it. But oh. that persisted right through that whole decade. So I can yeah. see where somebody was coming from, really. But anyway, you emigrated from Birmingham. Where did you go and stay? I st <laughs> When I first went out with... Uh, when I emigrated, I stayed with a friend of mine, uh, Tom Fraser. Uh, he played with Ronnie's band and I stayed in, in his place and I got myself a job, controlled data, and I got my own apartment and that was it. I was now uh, a landed immigrant. Yeah. So, it was me. And what, what city was that again? I missed that. Oh, electronics. I was. I, I, I grew oh, up in electronics. City. city. Uh, Toronto. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, piping and pipe bands, what happened there initially? Well, I got there for a while and Kenny Ella approached me to, to join his band. But at that time, they, the band was full. They had, I don't know, 20-some pipers. and You know, they'd walk on the field and there was, nobody had any pipers. They were all in the, in the, all, the all the reasonable ones were in his band. What band? Uh, uh, Clan McFarlane. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, Kenny Ella. A good, a nice guy, knew how to set the band up, knew uh -huh. his stuff, uh -huh. spent a lot of time, very clever. Uh, and I said, I don't, I don't know, Kenny. It's, uh, I don't know. Let me think about it. And then, I don't know, a week later, I got this phone call from Bill Livingston, right out the blue. And I really didn't know Bill. I'd seen him at some of the competitions in Scotland, but I really didn't know him. And he said, uh, we're interested in uh, starting the band up. Uh, would you be interested in coming down? It would be the General Motors band. Uh, wow. And I said, oh, OK, how many pipers you got? He said, well, you'd be number six. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I'll come on down anyway. So we, we went, I went down. And the practice was, uh, I don't know where it was. I remember we are in the room somewhere. And at the end of the practice, he was playing. And I, he was playing really well, a lovely bagpipe. And I'm really enjoying it. And he's playing away. And it wasn't until much later when he, he, he said to me, you know, he said, you were supposed to be the one coming to the band. I felt like I was being auditioned. By you. <laughs> I said, no. No, I said, I was really enjoying your playing. It's been that long since I heard, you know, the nice playing, you know. And yeah. He thought I was auditioning him. <laughs> no. And then we built the band up. We, we got some guys in and, and went from there. That would be 1980. End of 1980. 
in eighteen. Can you remember? Can you remember who the first half dozen pipers were that you're talking about at that time? Oh my gosh, John McKenzie. Uh -huh. I think he was one. Yeah. Uh, Bill. Andy Knox. Uh huh. He was one. Oh my gosh, that's a test, isn't it? Maybe uh, Sid Gerling. Sid Gerling. Well, uh, not bad. That's five out of six. <laughs> and then we had uh, we had uh, Harvey Dawson was the leading drummer. I was going to ask you about that. Uh -huh. And then then uh, Reed Maxwell came across. He emigrated, uh -huh. and w we managed to get him in the band, and he took over the drum corps, and that just changed everything. Absolutely. Uh, and by now we were starting to get together. We had different kilts and different hats and all this sort of stuff. And uh, and finally, Ian Symington played in played in the band. Mike Baker was playing in the band. But Ian Symington uh, was friendly with the, the 78th Frasers, uh, the historical group. And, and, and yeah. they actually said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll sponsor you. And you get new kilts and jackets and things, but you'll play at our functions. Uh -huh. So we did that. So we got the the nice orange kilts and yes. uh, and jackets. Uh, so we all looked the same, and uh, we we picked up a few names. You know the Pumpkin Highlanders, and because of the orange kilts, of the trick or treat band. But uh, we went on, and we were play, we were starting to play well and getting together.
type of chanters did they play initially, John? I'm thinking back to shots, the sound that you had at shots, okay? Big sound, McAllister, Reeds, all the rest of it. Uh, that would be uh, quite different, would it not, from, be from the sound that uh, uh, Bill Livingston would uh, have with the 78th Fraser Elders? Well, uh, Bill didn't do an awful lot with that stuff. He he was he was the music. He liked the music right. part. So did you say uh, the, the tone? Yeah, we, we said we've you know we got to play the reeds, the best reeds, and McAllister reeds. Okay, we know how to work them. We just keep squeezing them. Yeah, you know, and uh, which is what we did, and we, we were using the McAllister reeds, and we were, we were getting the sound and um. Pipers couldn't hide. Uh, right. One of the things that bands tend to do, the pipers disappear, tune the drones hidden away, and then they come into the band, and then somebody comes around with a meat and they tunes all the drones. But you don't know how those pipes sound away from the band. You know, are they any good? Are they quiet or what have you? Uh, so everybody, uh, everybody had to play. Yes. On their own, and that's that. That's what Rob Matheson did. Everybody had ended up playing. Their instrument on their own, uh, so you could hear the hear how how it sounded, you know, mm -hmm. and that that's that's what we did, uh, that's what we did with the uh, with the phrases, you so, know, to make sure they all had a good going bagpipe. So, uh, it, but were you trying to more or less uh, emulate the sound that you already had experienced at shots then? Yeah. What, was yeah. there much of a difference then at all between the, what you were doing with 78th and what you had done with shots in terms of? Well, um, what, what, but when, when you join shots, you play the hard read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when you join the phrases, you play the hard read, but somehow they managed to get a bit easier. Yeah. You I, know, the guys, oh, I don't need to sweat like that so much. And, you know, we, we, we shot stiff. Tom didn't like the read, he just take it out and put another one in. Yeah. Whereas those, the, you know, they'd squeeze them and squeeze them and, and, and you know, you have to adjust them and or what have you. But we ended up with a reasonable sound. Yes, you did. Uh, and... Uh, was that a softer sound? It, it wasn't as loud. No. For sure. Uh -huh. But we tried, we tried to get it, get it as brassy as we could. Yeah, uh, it was certainly a, a very correct to the beautiful sound that you got, especially we were, when you heard them at concerts and various other Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, when, when you hear the bands now, it, it's, it's they're not even close, no, you know. Uh, but back then, you know, they were pretty good, yes, absolutely. And, and the players, the players were dedicated, they worked hard, they really worked. Tommy Bowen was in, as I say, Mike Baker. Uh, Jerry Quigg, yeah. he was in the original. He 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 was the one that came up with the the lag and love setting, uh, that lag and love bit. And I remember I ended up uh, working in China for a little while, and that when I came back, they were playing Journey to Sky. Uh huh. That, yeah. that, and I thought, what on earth is that? Oh, geez, Journey to Sky. What is it? <laughs> and then, because I. Had, then, then you know, like Aye. get in the band, and once you started, you you grasped it. Oh, with the harmonies, uh, they went from uh, just seconds to, to to proper harmony, you know, yeah, yeah. fifths and what have you, and it just changed the sound of the bands to to what you have today. Yes, absolutely, just, just marvelous. But the that that was a they were a great concert band in the seventies, weren't they at that time? Yeah, we learned the words. He did yeah. Balamina, uh, for instance. Yeah, yeah. How, how was that experience for you? Oh, it was excellent, except when I did my solo. <laughs> uh, I did the solo, and of course, I was playing me playing away, and I, I think I must have stepped back and touched the curtain because my bass drone stopped. <laughs> so hey, I didn't I'm make it on. Yet, <laughs> I didn't I'm make it yet. on the album. Uh, I did that in the last line of a fever uh, in Glasgow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Angus McClellan says, why did you stop? 
I said, oh, you kind of keep playing with it, a bass drone, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, well, it just, woof, takes the body out of your instrument. Oh, yeah. and then, oh just yeah. finished yeah. the end of the tune, waved, and off I went, you know. I remember watching you, John, uh, when you, you did a concert in Glasgow in the concert hall, and uh, you did a solo there as well. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> And I, I can even tell you the tune you played from memory. Oh the Island Lullaby, Donald McLeod's uh, Island Lullaby. Okay. Right? Went very well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It was at one of these August concerts, no, pre World Day uh, concerts. Oh my gosh. Uh, we, did, we did a lot, uh, a lot of concerts. Uh, did you. Enjoy the competitive uh, scene more than the concerts, or was it vice versa? Uh, how did how did you feel about uh, travel? I, I I enjoyed the cons. I enjoyed the competition. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Though I, though I had a I buried my head in the sand. We would compete, but I wouldn't listen to any other band. I'm not the else does either. And, and part of the theory was that if I thought if I felt that we'd we'd won or we'd played better than this band here, and they, they scored higher than we, we did, uh, then I didn't, I didn't have to worry about thinking how badly they played or how well they played. Aye. I just said, they must have played better than us. Aye, just do but if, if I heard somebody, game, I, thought they played, if I thought they played badly and beat us, I would be really upset. <laughs> uh, so many years were you with uh, 78 then? Uh, probably 1980 to 19, 19, 1990. Uh -huh. I thought I'd, I thought I left in 1979 spring, but Michael Gray sent me a little video of a of a thing in the band in uh, a competition. I think it was 1989 oh, yeah. is when I thought, and I actually left the band in 1990. That's it. Aye. Because my son, my second son, was born in seven, uh, eight sheepers in eighty nine. My first son was born in eighty seven, same year as the worlds, and uh, in nineteen ninety, uh, we were just tired out with the kids and trying to play in the band and all that. So something had to give. Yeah. So uh, that that's that was it. Nineteen ninety spring oh. when I. You yeah. retired from the, the, the band yeah. uh, at that point because uh, you just family, work, pipe bands, everything yeah. just getting top. Yeah, just yeah. Too, too heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Did you ever play with a band after that? I did. Uh, we moved to Nova Scotia in 1992, was where we are now. And I, I ended up being pipe major the st of. Uh, Halifax Police. Yeah. And we were starting to, again, they were, they were good, good bunch of guys, but they didn't have the, the, the right sort of discipline. Yeah. Uh, they did things they thought was right. And I was saying, no, 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 we have to change that. Uh, it was a two hour practice and, and to go to practice and two hours to come home. And uh, it, got, it got a little bit much again. Aye. I managed three. I managed three years, um, and the band was. We brought the band right up, and they were up at a, a reasonable level. Yeah. And uh, I had to. I, I got Roddy, uh, Roddy to take over the band, and I, I had to step back. And uh, can I hark back, John? A, I'm really anxious to know about this. You you taught a uh, Mike Gray for a wee while. Yeah. 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 And uh, Mike's telling me that you're quite meticulous about the uh, uh, various matters and the, and the uh, uh, piping. No, that's what's your approach to maybe teaching a, a, an individual? And what are you listening for, and what, how do you improve them? Generally speaking, well, you just you just break break the tune down uh, and and try and figure out what it is there that would make it better, uh -huh. whether it's cleaning doublings up or one of the things is to try and find tunes that suit the piper yes because I, I, not all tunes suit your style you know your I, own yes. personal style uh -huh. some play tunes because it's the fashion 
and other other people play them because they like them. Yeah. So you pick out the tunes that they like, uh, and then just go through how they're playing them. Uh, you know, make sure they're playing them. There's nothing magical about it. We just uh, make sure the the upbeat is is very important. Mm -hmm. And the way the, the way I look at the beat, um, your beat is if you visualize your beat uh, electronically, it would come up. Yeah. Like if, if you analyze a, a click on the metronome, it's not just a, a click, it comes up, goes across and goes down. So on the top of that, you have space. And that space is valuable to so you can move the note around where yeah. that beat is. If you play ahead of the beat, just fractionally ahead, it wants to feel give the feel of moving forward. If you play it to the back of that beat, it wants to feel like it's dragging. But you can use that to get expression out of your tunes. Yes. I... You know, you can you can move, that. that's all we've got. We can't make it louder or softer. So mm -hmm. all we can do is just move that little beat around a bit yeah. on, on the beat and then the upbeat's the same, you know. And that that will, if if you're born into to piping, you do it automatically, you don't even think about it. But some some play directly on the beat and that, that's the way they've been taught, bang, bang, bang. And you think, well, if you if, if you can you can move that about to create a feeling in the tune, and that, that's what I look for. And that's it's, helping a, somebody. it's almost an instinctive thing, John, isn't it? The simple uh, they're too uh, focused on this uh, beat on the beat, and they're taking the music right out of their playing. Yeah, sort of thing. yeah, that's that's the thing. Yeah. And it's very difficult to instill music into somebody if they don't maybe have a propensity that, for right. expressing it anyway. You know, if they're singing or whatever, they would sing a tune and maybe stretch a wee note or cut a note. Yeah, that, that's it. That's it. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's it. Trying to explain that to, to, to people. And that, that's how you do it. That's how I do it anyway. Yeah. Visualise the beat has uh, a top on it. And, and you just move backwards and forwards across that top. That's how we, that's how, it's the only way we can get expression. And he's quite particular about the, how to play all the doublings and tones. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah they've, got, they've got to be. And those, again, can be opened up and closed up. Yes. Depends on what you're playing. And it's if, you've got lot, if you've got lots of time to play, like, the, the part ending, you know, the C doubling down to low A and then a burrow in the B. Yeah. You can open it up a little bit. Yeah. But as you play you're playing something else where it needs to be quick, tighten it up. Yeah. But it has to has to be clean. You have to know. Uh has to be clean. If it's not clean, you have to clean it up. Yeah. You know. But again, it's back to what you did yourself way back at the beginning, where you were listening and uh, observing, and I suppose that is a uh, has proved a, a great foundation for your, oh, all absolutely. your oh, yeah. bagpiping life, really. And yeah. it allows you to pass on these observations and everything else to other people that you are listening to in terms of teaching them or whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, what about blowing the ever, how do you uh, get them to blow their instruments properly? Ah, uh, well, that's another, nah. I don't know. Nah. Yeah, just pound away at that there's, there's the, the instrument had a, again you have to teach them how to make the drones in tune properly Aye. uh and and just i don't know really blow steady usually the the players that i i, I teach don't have much trouble with that Aye. i think uh, it's I, the I, use I, of the elbow as well and the standing oh, oh absolutely yeah you, you, uh, you, the arm shouldn't move it, very little movement on the arm, yeah. You know, uh, none of this blowing till it's empty and then big breaths. It's aye, aye, you just aye. keep it and listen ever so carefully to what's going on to your drones. They'll tell you what's going on. Yes, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah. The other thing you mentioned earlier on was how come I joined Shots and Dyke Head the second time. So the second time when I joined Shots, it was, it was it was kind of again like most things I do by accident, it wasn't planned. 
uh, I wasn't playing with the the 78s. Uh, there was a bit of a uh, a bit of an undercurrent going, and and I uh, I had left, and there was uh, another guy, uh, Biggie and Donaldson. He he had left, uh, and he asked me. Uh, if I knew anybody in, in a band in Scotland because he would like to play with a band in Scotland and we had a shop at the time and I said well I'm going over in January to the trade show and uh, he had a shop uh, the British shop so I said oh I'll meet you over there it turns out uh, his plane was delayed because of snow but uh, the last day there I got talking to Rob Matheson and I just generally asked him, I said, uh, do you take a pipe of her, a pipe is from a, uh, an overseas band? And I was thinking about Ian. Uh, and he said, well, like who? And I said, well, Ian Donaldson. And goodness knows where he came from. I said, oh, and myself. <laughs> and he said, of course. So that's that's how I ended up playing in the band the second time, and the first time round, believe it or not, this was two thousand and five. We we won the worlds, and that was the best performance uh, I think I've ever played. In the overall feeling of the band was just fantastic. I'll never forget that as long as I live. The the, the harmony, the notes, the type of tunes we played. Um, the bass, the, the the tenor sections, how they played along, Jim on the snare, my goodness me, it was like going to heaven. I, I will never forget that as long as I live. People ask me why I didn't play P Rock. I... Uh, when, when I took uh, the, the lessons from Ian McPherson, it was 10, 10 lessons for 45 minutes in his tenement flat. Um, I lost, it was, I just joined the shots. So I was learning the shots tunes. I was playing a strong bagpipe. Yeah. And, uh, I did learn, I learned four, four P rock with music. Uh, -huh. uh, but all the other tunes I learned, and there must've been 50, uh, without music. And then I had the band tunes. And by the time, uh, I'd sort of gathered my thoughts. I'd, I'd kind of got fed up trying to play p -Rock. it was because you had to have a you couldn't play a a band bagpipe no no it's a different to play a p -Rock. you could play a p -Rock, but you might you might only get through it once with a lot of effort you know right. so uh, it, it just fizzled away and i never managed to get back at it well you've got plenty of time john well i, I yeah <laughs> when, when i first moved down to nova scotia here dr uh -huh. angus mcdonald was here yes and I was actually going to go visit Angus mm -hmm. to uh, to see what he could uh, see if he could do anything with me. But he, he ended up going back to Scotland. I was fighting for tree uh, uh, doing medicine there. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I, so it never happened. Wonderful conversation with Doctor Angus as well. I, great hospitality and everything else. Uh, oh yeah. So listen. John, that was very valuable. You've had a marvellous uh, piping in life and you've impinged uh, greatly on other folk that you've met in the, the piping scene and it's been an honour to speak to you here today and thanks very much for your time to pipe us persuasion. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Alan.